ownership is the Rust most unique feature. One of the reasons why I decided to learn Rust. This has some very important implications for the language. Ownership enables Rust to have some memory safety features without needing a garbage collector. And it's very important to understand how it works to proceed with further lessons. In this lesson, we will see what is ownership, what is the stack and what is the heap a very simple demo, variable scope, and then the string type. We have worked so far with something called the string literals. The string type with capital S is actually a type in Rust. It is a bit special. Then we'll talk about memory allocation and the drop trait, then the move trait, clone, and copy. All the programming languages, they need, they must manage how they use the memory while their programs are running. One approach is to have a garbage collector that is used to regularly basically clean up the memory, removing all the variables that uh, are not used anymore. This is, makes things simple but not efficient. A second approach is to explicitly allocate and free the memory. Some languages, especially the low level languages, they have this approach. But usually this has a cons. It's harder to code the using these uh, languages because you need to handle all these uh, memory manually. If you ever tried to uh, locate and free memory in C, probably you didn't like that. Uh, Rust is different because in Rust the memory is managed using a set of rules that the compiler will check, of course, uh, at compile time. If any of these rules is violated, the program will refuse to compile. Ownership will not slow down your run program. It's not a feature or an overhead that it's on top of our program and it's doing something. Ownership is a concept. Ownership is a way to code in a safe and also efficient way. For this lesson, we will focus using string with capital S. Let's talk about the stack and the heap. The stack and the heap are two memory structures to handle data for the program. So, and in many languages, you don't really need to understand the difference or the implementation of the stack and the heap. Why is this so important to understand? Because in Rust, which is a systems language, whether a value is on the stack or the heap, this changes the behavior of the language with that type with that uh, value, with that variable. And so you need to understand this uh, when you want to make some decisions, architectural decisions in creating your program. Both the stack and the heap are parts of this memory. A stack is what you see on the left, and it's like a pile, a tower of elements. And the heap is more like a blob, a place where I can pick something or just throw something. The stack stores values in order you create this uh, sort of pile of tower. We start from the bottom and then we, we put something on top of it. It uses an approach called leaf, which stands for last in, first out. You can think about a, a pile of plates and you put them one on top of each other. To add something onto the stack, there is an operation called pushing or push, and to remove data, there is an operation called popping or pop to remove the data that is at the top of the stack. All the data stored on the stack, they must have a known size, 10 kilobytes, and also a fixed size. These sides can't change during the execution of the program. At some point, I might have to do with some data which has an unknown size. This size, maybe it will change during the execution of the program. Okay, so if one of these examples would occur, then this, it can't be stored on the stack. In this case, we need to use a different data structure called heap. The heap is less organized, but this doesn't mean that it's not useful. It's very useful. When you put data on the heap, you request some space, somewhere. And there is something called the memory allocator. First, it finds a big enough empty spot in the memory, 
in, of the heap. Then it marks that this, okay, now this is in use, it flags it, and then it returns a pointer, which is the location's address. This whole process is called allocating, and I really see here a very strong analogy with a restaurant. If I go to a restaurant with three uh, more friends, usually they'll find a table which is the same size or maybe a bit bigger. If they don't have a, a table of uh, four people, they will probably give a six one. The table will be in use. In that case, it's easy to understand because people are, are eating there. And then the pointer that usually is the number of the table. Something super interesting here is this. You see there is a stack here. We can store the pointer of the heap in the stack. Why? Because the pointer has a fixed uh, amount of data that will not change during the execution of the program. A pointer is perfect to be stored in the stack. We can store the pointer on the stack and to get the data we can follow the pointer that has been stored in the stack and the value of the pointer are there. Some operations with the heap and the stack. To insert something we do something called pushing or allocating. Pushing to the stack is really fast. It just We have a new plate, we put this on top of the pile of plates. And the allocator ne never has to search if there is a place or store new data. It's just put on top. Allocating some space on the heap is usually harder, as I said before. The allocator must first find a big enough space, then they need to perform the bookkeeping, and then they need also to prepare the next allocation that will come after that. To access data, accessing data to the, st to the stack is usually also very quick. Accessing data on the heap is unfortunately slow, because we need to follow a pointer and then find that memory that or maybe we have different pointers to different places of memory if we get back to the analogy with the restaurant usually the waiter they get all the orders at the same table before moving on the next one because they have to deal with the memory which is close to each other it's easier to have to deal with data which is close to other data like it is in the stack in the heap they can be absolutely far away. You will find it anyway, but usually this is uh, slower. Just something about function, we'll see this in the next lesson. When we call a function in Rust, we've done this multiple times, but to understand what will happen from a memory point of view, the values are passed into the function, including all the pointers uh, that we, we might need, and the function's local variable, and they're pushed onto the stack. So the functions, they work more with the stack, but they can have some pointer that points to the heap, of course. And when the function is over, it goes out of scope, the values of the functions, they get popped out of the stack. What's the purpose of ownership? The primary purpose of ownership is to manage the heap data. So the data that is in the heap. And it does basically three important things. First one is to, it keeps track of what code is using what data in the heap. Two, it minimizes the amount of duplication of data on the heap. We will see this soon with an example. It has to do with the move trait. And then cleaning up all the unused data on the heap. We will see how this is done on the heap, calling something called the drop trait which are the ownership rules. Number one, each value has an owner. So there is not a value without an owner. There can only be one owner at a time, so no multiple owners of the same value. And the third one is that when the owner goes out of scope, the value will be dropped, You calling the drop function. And now we are ready to start our demo, the variable scope. Let's uh, declare a string literal. Let s equal to hello. We have these curly brackets here. So this does mean that here s is not valid, as it's not declared yet. Here on the declaration, s is valid from this point. Let's say that I want to do something, okay, with the s uh, variable. s is still valid. And here, out of this, the scope is now over. And so it's no longer valid. So this is variable scope. Let's remove all of these. And let's declare a string, a string type with capital S. Let S equal. And here we can use this one, a string from 
hello. I want to show you that when we have a string in this way, we can mutate this. So first of all, we need to add a, a mute keyword as push word. So there is this um, method that we can call uh, on this uh, string type. And here we can print uh, this. And in this case, we have hello world. This string value here is allocated on the heap and not on the stack. When we use string literals, we are storing these somewhere in the binary. So it's like written in stone. And if we use the string type, we are putting this value on the heap. I want to show you what happens when we go out of scope with the string. So it's similar, of course, here S is not valid. Here S is valid, of course. Also here, of course, S is valid and on the heap. At the end here, what will happen? Something similar, but here, since S is not valid anymore, here, S is not valid anymore, we call drop. Since this type is stored on the heap, ownership will know that we'll have to call a special function called drop. So it's different from the string literal when the things are just on the stack. It looks the same, but the, the here is the big difference. We Rust is basically calling a function to clean up the memory. And this is not common in, in other programming languages. We have a programming language that calls a specific function at the end of this scope on this variable that is stored on the heap. And now I want to talk about the way variables and data they interact with each other. Let's create a variable called s1, let s1 equal 5, let s2 equal s1. Okay, and now I want to print these two values. I want to print the value of s2 first, print ln s2, print s2, and then here print s1, cargo run dash q. And indeed, it works. Now I want to try something different. Instead of five, I want to put a string literal and I want this to be hello. So string literals, I remember that you that they have a fixed amount. They are written in stone. They can't change. Cargo run dash q. It works. Hello, hello. And now this. Instead of this, I put this string from hello. Instead of having a string literal here, I define s1 as a string from hello, and then I do let s2 equal s1. Cargo run dash q, bam, error. Let's try to understand by reading here. Bore of moved value s1. I'm reading here, move of course because, because s1 is type string which does not implement the copy trait. Okay, copy. Why? Uh, value moved here, value borrowed. There is also a spoiler of a, a possible solution. Check here at the bottom left. We, de we declared an S1 variable and then S let S2 equal S1. At the beginning, we had something like this S1 that points on the heap with this pointer. I hope you all agree with this. We had this uh, situation when we had on online two. When we do S2 equal S1, you might think that something like this happens. Not exactly this, but this to have an idea. Let's try to visualize this. So S2 equal S1. Okay, so the pointer of S2 has to point at the same, same memory location than the S1. If we had this, this could lead to many memory leaks and memory issues because then when S1, if S1 goes out of scope and S2 is not out of scope, we should clean this memory. How this would be possible? This could, this could lead to many, many problems. So this is not what happens. Similar, but we are not there. Someone else might think, hey, but we said let S2 equal S1, maybe something like this happened. So with the equal, we created like a, a whole new copy S2 with, say, with this. So someone might think uh, that uh, this is what happened. We, had, we have a, a, what is called a deep copy or hard copy. We might think that this is what happened. 
This is not what happened when we use the equal sign. What really happened when we put the equal? It was this. We moved the reference to S2 and S1 now is invalid, is not valid anymore. This is super important. When we do let S2 equal S1 for a type that is on the heap, this is what happens. And this is why we get that error. This is the explanation of what happens when we do this, which is called the move trait. We move to another variable. Let's try to just do what the compiler is suggesting. Let's say, hey, try to do s1.clone. And let's see what happens in, in this case. s1.clone. Let's try again. And in this case, it now works because we have s1. Dot clone. When we read the line number three here, we have a string s1 and then s2 equal s1 dot clone. Clone is exactly what was here on column three. Clone is to deep copy the heap data of the string and not just the stack data and the pointer. Here, in this case, we can absolutely do this and it produces this, uh, exactly this behavior. Why all of this? Why do we have to do dot clone instead of just equal? Because Rust, by default, it doesn't want us to do whole hard copies on everything which is on the heap because this is expensive in terms of resources. If we are coding fast and we are putting equal, this will create what is called a shallow copy. And this is also from a human perspective. When we will read some code and at some point we will read A, let s2 equal s1 dot clone and say, okay, here, maybe something is happening. So we should be very intentional when we want to do a hard copy of a variable which is stored on the heap. So we can, of course we can do it, but using a specific method. Some of you might be confused because they say, okay, but this is maybe the first time that I see this clone thing. So why, why when we had this, it worked. Did I confuse you even more? This does work, you might say. Hey, now I didn't clone this. Why did this work and with the string is not working? There is something in Rust called the copy trait, which is for the stack only data. For some types, such as integers, and we know the sides at compile time, they are stored entirely on the stack and the copies of these values, they are very easy to make and there is absolutely no reason for the S1 to stop being valid or X in this case. We don't need to call the clone in this case, but how does Rust know this? Because Rust has a special annotation called the copy trait for the types that are stored on the stack and they are uh, types such integers. When we use the equal, when assigning another variable, it doesn't move, but it's simply and trivially copied. And the old one is still valid. The integers, they have the copy trait. If a type has the drop trait, I remember you the string, remember the string has the drop trait to free the memory at the end of the scope, you can't add the copy trait to them. They need to behave in the other way because they are stored on the heap and they need to use the process of having the drop trait and they can't have the copy one. Who can implement copy? As a general rule, simple scalar values, they can all implement a copy. You can check the lesson on data types. If there is a type that requires a location or some, some form of resource, and they're basically they are on the heap, they can't implement the copy trait. In this lesson we saw, what is ownership? The difference between the stack and the heap, of course applied to Rust, because this is what we are interested in. Then we saw a very quick demo about the variable scope, the string type, capital S, how to allocate memory and the drop trait, which is used for types that are on the heap, and then the move trait, the clone trait, and the copy trait. Well done.